Hey friends! My name is Desiree, aka Mama Friendly, and I do all sorts of videos on my channel, from cooking videos to planner videos, vlogs, hauls, homeschool videos with a Disney twist, a little bit of everything. So if any of that sounds like fun to you, I hope that you'll subscribe and join me on my YouTube adventure. For the last couple of years, we've been doing Disney homeschool themed videos around Disney movies, characters, or rides. This year, I decided to change things up and we're still doing Disney themed homeschooling, but we're going to be centering our lessons around the Epcot World Showcase. I thought this would be a great theme to base our lessons on because it gives us so much opportunity for different branches of learning. Obviously, we're learning about geography. We're going to learn about each of the different countries' languages and traditions and culture, how people live there as opposed to how we live. So we've got social studies thrown in the mix as well. I'm, of course, throwing in a lot of life skills. So cooking has always been an important part of our homeschool series. And we're going to aim to create an authentic recipe every single time that has to do with the country or traditions that we're studying. And of course, from a sensory perspective, I love including art projects in our theming. So every video is going to include at least one or two different art projects. Something else to consider is that my child is on the autism spectrum. He has nonverbal autism. And so we're going to be tailoring the activities, obviously, to his level because he is the child that I am teaching. You can, of course, feel free to tailor these activities to whatever developmental or educational level makes sense for the kiddos that you're teaching. I'm gonna do my best to include resources and activities in a Pinterest board that pertains to each and every theme. So all of these videos are gonna have a Pinterest board linked in the description box so you could check it out. This will give you some ideas for activities that we didn't get to cover in the video or even ideas for taking the activities we did do and tweaking them to fit kiddos of different ages or different abilities. One big consideration that I wanted to make before jumping into this particular string of themed videos is that I wanted to make sure to approach this from a place of cultural appreciation and not appropriation. I want to be able to respect the people and the traditions of these countries without resorting to tropes. That being said, we're going to try to be as authentic as possible in all of our facts, in all of our art activities, especially in all of our recipes. I'm going to try my best to outsource this information from people native to the countries that we're studying wherever I'm able. So now that I've explained a little bit about what we're trying to do here, let's jump into the country for this month. I usually let you guys know about the books and about the country's particular events, holiday celebrations, what have you, in a voiceover. But I am so excited about these books that I wanted to actually just tell you about them and everything kind of intertwines. This one is called Japanese Celebrations. And as you can see, it actually goes through an explanation of what each of the festivals are what it pertains to them as far as like the food, the decoration, why they're there, why they have to do with that particular festival. It tells you the dates that they happen. There's even some really obscure ones like this is a beam throwing ceremony, but you know, I didn't know that this existed until today. So I think this is pretty awesome. It's also got little like crafts you can do for each of the holidays. I really, really enjoy this book a lot. So I wanted to make sure to share it with you guys. The next one I have here is I Live in Tokyo. And it is a children's book for reading. And it's to do with a lot of the like cultural and societal norms of living in Japan. Tokyo is of course the capital city of Japan. There's Japan right here, here's Tokyo. And it's told from the perspective of a seven year old girl. So she talks about where she lives, how she lives, again, more holidays, things that happen on any given month, and the ways that she as a child celebrates these things. So this is really cool because it gives you the perspective from the kid. Uh, I know that obviously a lot of festivals, <laughs> what the kids do and what the adults do might be a little bit different. This is also a much simpler book to read. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of text on each page. The book itself is pretty small, so it's good for early readers. And then lastly, this one might be my favorite one. 
all about Japan story songs crafts and games for kids so I genuinely feel like you can build an entire <laughs> curriculum maybe around this book and you can see it's got broken down here into the introduction of Japan everyday life holidays and then language and culture so it's got loads of ideas for things that you can do to celebrate each of the events, ways that other people celebrate them. You do have recipes in this book, which I really enjoy. So I wanted to make sure to share each of these books with you because, oh, there's even other countries. You've got Philippines, Korea, Thailand, and China. Maybe there's even more than that, and that's just all that fit on the sleeve. These books are amazing. I really, really enjoy them. I'm going to have all of them linked down below. And if you'd rather not get any of the books and you just want to read about the celebrations, I'm also going to have a couple of links in the description box to some articles I found that kind of go in depth into a few of the Japanese celebrations as well. For our sensory activity for this unit, I looked around in that global art book we always reference and a lot of the stuff just didn't seem like it would be really fun for my son, to be completely honest. Um, but they did talk about Zen gardens with sand and how it's something that is a tradition in Japan and it could be a fun sensory activity. So I could have gotten any old box laying around, any old bin, and just filled it with sand. But it would have been more of a pain to actually go out and get sand somewhere than to just get this, which is the tray and it brings the sand in it. It's meant for tracing letters, numbers. It's a Montessori activity, but it will serve us just fine for this. So I'm gonna have this linked down below in the description box in case you'd like to get one for yourself. I also got, ironically, this is Rocks and Minerals of the USA and we are in fact studying Japan now. USA was last month, but I thought that this would be fun to kind of add into our Zen garden. See, so this just brings a wood tray, it brings sand, it's got a blue bottom so that you can actually see what you're doing and I really love that it has a lid. So when we're done playing with this, we can cover it up and put it away and not have to worry too much about accidental spillage. So here it is, very simple, your little baggies of sand that you can open up and put out into your tray. And then you might wonder, whoa, is that enough? Ah, uh, it's enough-ish. I think that we can probably get away with using the second bag too. So this other box that I have here is just a plain box. And what I'm gonna do with that is I'm gonna use some scissors to cut out little combs in like different shapes. And that's going to kind of act as like our broom, I guess, if you will, for our sensory situation here. So if your kiddos are older, they're better with scissors and so on, they could probably do this part themselves. I'm going to go ahead and do it for kiddo so that it's safer and so that he can just focus on the sensory aspect. So I've got my sand down. We're gonna open up our little rocks. If I can find this on Amazon, then I'll link it as well. Obviously it's not necessary. You can just go outside and uh, grab any rocks or stones that you see pretty much anywhere and just throw them in here. You don't even really need rocks. I just thought it would be a fun addition um, to give it a little more texture, a little more visual interest. This is definitely a very sturdy box. But I think that that's going to be a good thing because when I'm going to make the little combs out of this, yeah, it's harder for me to do it now, but I think that that means that the combs are going to last longer. They're going to stand up to the elements much better. I'll tell you what though, these safety scissors, I'm <laughs> it's having a hard time cutting it, so to speak. So I'm going to, see, I want to make them big enough where they have a nice amount that you can hold on to and grip. So I think that's a good size. And maybe I'll do one more in like a different shape, a different texture. So I'll do one that's maybe kind of wavy. And I wanna make the shapes big enough 
that when he pulls them across the sand, it'll actually like have definition, you know? Okay, so that's one. Let me see if it actually, yeah. Okay, so it is making a wavy pattern. I like that. And then we can use the smooth side. Oh yeah, that's satisfying to kind of just smooth it out. Very good. And now this one, I'll make a little more severe and I'm gonna do just triangle shapes so that it's gonna be a more obvious sort of comb pattern. We'll see how this goes. There's not as many teeth to it, but yeah, see? You got more definition that way. Very nice. Now we're gonna pick all this up. We'll open up our little rocks. I think I'm gonna need my scissors for this too. I'm gonna spread them around and let kiddo loose and let him play. Yeah, you see how cool it's sand with the little rocks? And then look, look at this. You hold this part and you can brush the sand. Oh, you just wanna to touch it? Okay, that's even better. You wanna take them out? Oh, I see. Cool. Whoa, you see how you make a pattern? You can write letters. Look, we could do A. <laughs> we do a similar activity where we dig um, potato head pieces, etc., out of sand. Mm -hmm. So I think he thinks that's what we're doing here. Well, we'll keep playing with it. I think we'll have fun. We just have to keep practicing with it so we can come to understand what we're meant to do here. But I think this is very pretty and very relaxing. All right, pallies, as always, I wanted to share some documentaries with you guys about Japan. And these videos are all made for kids. As such, I'm not able to save them onto a playlist, but that's fine. I will have them all linked down below in the description box so that you can watch them at your leisure. This one is about six, seven minutes long. It's called Japan for Kids. It's just a quick guide to Japan. This one is about four minutes long, as you can see, and it's also called Japan for Kids, A Kid's Guide to Japan. And lastly, PBS actually has a documentary that's about an hour long called Wonders of Japan. So I'm going to have this link down below as well. Because it's public access TV, anybody should be able to watch it. So this is obviously a little longer. It's probably going to be better for older kiddos that have a higher attention span. But there's lots of information out there to learn all about the history of Japan and even its modern marvels, tourism, etc. The time has come once again, my friends, to show you my favorite channel for tours all over Disney, and that is 4KWDW. Today, of course, we're checking out the Japan Pavilion. They've got so many amazing art installations. The architecture is just out of hand. If you stand right here, you can get just such a nice view of all the other countries in the World Showcase. There are, of course, restaurants. They have one of the hugest shops of all of the World Showcase, full of all sorts of snacks and cool toys and clothes directly from Japan. There's a beautiful pond feature here, full of koi. That's a really nice, quiet spot if you need to get away from the crowds in the park. Of course, there's a kid cot center so the kiddos can stop by and make some sort of craft or some sort of activity to do with the Japanese culture. See around this way is that water feature. It's so, so, so nice. And pre-COVID, I'm not sure if they still have it, but there used to be a drummer show at the very front of the pavilion. That was one of our favorite things to stop and watch when we were on our way anywhere. Just kind of grab a snack, grab a seat, get some entertainment. This is one of my favorite pavilions, truly. It's just so pretty. So if you want to check out this video yourself, I will, as always, have it linked down below in the description box, along with the documentaries and so on that I've mentioned in this video. It's time for our Japanese recipe. We're going to be making ramen noodle soup out of our cooking class global feast book. I'm gonna have this linked down below. I really, really love this book for loads of reasons, but I talked all about that in our curriculum haul earlier this, well, I guess not this year, but last year, you know what I mean. I'll post that video up in the corner in case you'd like to check it out. What I love about this is that for the most part, it's just a matter of dumping everything into a pot. So kiddo's going to have a lot of fun helping me with this. 
for two servings, we're gonna need a tablespoon of either sesame or vegetable oil. I always have sesame oil on hand because it is delicious. We're also gonna need two to four garlic cloves crushed. We're gonna need one to two tablespoons of grated ginger. I don't typically keep raw ginger in the house, so I'm gonna use some ground ginger instead, probably not that much. Four cups of either miso or chicken broth. I happen to have vegetable stock because it's gluten-free. You can use whatever broth or stock you have on hand. Two cups of water. You also need a tablespoon of soy sauce. I'm gonna be using coconut aminos in its place because I avoid soy. Six to 10 shiitake mushrooms. You want these thinly sliced. These are already sliced and now they're in focus. So we're gonna use them just like this. Next we need one carrot cut into rounds. I've got like a carrot and a half left in the fridge so I figure we might as well use that up. You could use three quarter cups of diced firm tofu or you could use cooked chicken, cooked shrimp, cooked beef. We're gonna leave that out today. I just wasn't feeling up to cooking any proteins and as you know, we don't use tofu around here because we tend to avoid soy. You're gonna need either two packets of ramen where you would just use the noodles or you're gonna need one of these. I really love this brand and it's rice noodles, so they're gluten-free. We're gonna use the whole box. The whole box is more than six ounces, which is what the recipe calls for, but that's fine. That just means our soup will be a little noodlier than most. And lastly, you're gonna need two chopped green onions for garnish at the end. Now, this is completely optional, but I'm also gonna soft boil a couple of eggs to serve on top of our ramen. And you can also top it at the end with some miso paste if you're not soy free, another little drizzle of sesame oil, more soy sauce or coconut aminos, uh, nori, seaweed, or bean sprouts. Any of these things would be great accompaniments. You ready to cook? Yeah? Oh, good, okay, here we go. So I'm smushing up my garlic first before we start. And in the meantime, I'm gonna put the tablespoon of sesame oil into the pot. I'm gonna put the pot on medium heat and I'm gonna let the oil start to get hot so that we can put our garlic and our ginger in there to cook for about three minutes. Smush, smush, smush. And we're gonna Chop, 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 chop. You see how mommy's making it little? Chop, 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 chop. Chop, 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 chop. Okay, in goes the garlic. And we're going to just toss a little bit of ginger in here, maybe a little bit more than that. There we go. That's that's a lot of ginger, but that's fine. I think it'll be good. We're going to let that kind of sweat a little bit in the oil for a few minutes. And in the meantime, I'm going to chop up the carrots so kiddo can just help me toss everything in when it's time. It's already smelling so good in here. Okay, so I have my assistant. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to pour our entire four cups of broth into the pot. Look, can you pick this up and put it in here? You need two hands because it's pretty heavy, okay? Here, both hands. Pour it in there, please. Mm -hmm. All right, more, more, more. Mm -hmm. All of it, yeah, keep going. More, 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 more. Mm -hmm. There you go, you're doing such a good job. Perfect. Oh, we still got a little more. That's okay. I'll get the rest. And next, we need two cups of water. So can you please put this in there? Go ahead. Whoa! Splash zone. Thank you. We're going to turn our heat up to high now. And we're going to put our carrots and our mushrooms in. If you were going to use tofu or cooked proteins of any sort, chicken, beef, shrimp, now would be the time to put that in as well. Papi, you want to help me with the veggies? Look, we need to put in our carrots and our mushrooms. So here's our carrots. Here you go. One, throw them in. Go one, two, three. And as for our mushrooms, I'm just going to do a handful. It says, how many did it say I wanted? Six to ten, right? Six to ten thinly sliced. Eh, we'll go for two handfuls. 
That might be too much, but that's fine with me. I'm a fan. Almost forgot, you also want to put your tablespoon of soy sauce, or in our case, coconut aminos, in with the broth and the water so that that flavoring really gets into your veggies and your protein while you're cooking them. So I'm gonna call that about a tablespoon. We could always add more at the end. And now this is all going to cook on high heat for five minutes. Okay, it's been five minutes. So now we're going to put all of our noodles in here. This feels really shallow, but that's just because it's a very large pan. Uh, hopefully we have enough space for all of our noodles to fit. They are going to cook for about three minutes or until they're soft. So obviously the three minutes is a ballpark figure. It really depends on what kind of noodles you're using. Okay, our soup is ready. You can probably hear it boiling in the background, which means it's super, super, super hot. So gonna ladle some into my bowl here. Trying to focus on just getting broth and veggies right now because I feel like I'm gonna have to go back in here with tongs to get all of these noodles out. There is a very generous portion of ramen soup and there's still plenty left in the pot. I'm gonna drizzle just a teensy bit more, whoops, sesame oil on top. I'm gonna chop up my scallions right over the top. This is going to be so good. A little pop of freshness and some onion flavor. Probably doing a little more <laughs> than most people would, but I am a very big fan of green onion. I think that could actually stand some more green onion, but we'll wait on that for now. Right now, I'm gonna grab an egg that I soft boiled while the soup was cooking. And we're gonna plop that right on top. I know I should probably do this with chopsticks, but I have zero skills. So instead, we're gonna go at this with our spork. Look at that beautiful egg. I'm gonna get a little bit of everything in here. Hey, turns out that that's basically impossible, but that's fine, we're doing our best. That is very, very, very hot but very, very, very tasty. Came together super easily. It was very, very quick. This is definitely gonna make it into our regular meal rotation. And it'll give me a chance to practice with my chopsticks. All right, friends, that's gonna do it for our Japan unit study. The recipe was a lot of fun to put together. Kiddo actually really enjoyed helping me with that one. And um, it was absolutely delicious. I will say <laughs> it does not do great as leftovers just because the noodles continue to absorb the broth in the fridge. And so the next time you get to it, it's gonna be a lot less soupy, still delicious, still very filling. But um, just be warned, I guess. The sensory activity, once my son realized that he did not need to just pick stuff out of it and he could actually just play around with it, he's come around to it, he's enjoying it a lot more. And I think that this is definitely something that we're gonna stick to and continue to use because the more he's exposed to these things, the less he like finds them icky. And it's all mental because, <laughs> which doesn't make it any less valid, but when he has the sand on him and he doesn't realize it's there, he's fine. It's just when he notices it that he goes, oh my gosh. So. If it weren't that way and he just absolutely hated it, period, and there was no convincing him otherwise, I wouldn't push. But because I can see that it's just a matter of him acclimating, I think that we are gonna continue to practice it every couple weeks or so, just leave it there and uh, bring it out. Luckily, like I showed you guys, it has a lid, so I'm able to put it away on the shelf and not worry about it making a mess or getting dust or anything in it. So we're very much looking forward to continuing that. We had a lot of fun with this study. The instrument in particular, the Den Den, my son is just running around the house with it 24 seven. <laughs> all sorts of drum sounds happening all the time. He always really enjoys it when we implement an instrument into our studies. And so I have a feeling I have not heard the last of the Den Den, which is fine with me. I believe our next unit is Morocco, if I'm not mistaken. We're nearing the home stretch here, guys. All we've got left are uh, Morocco, France, the UK and Canada? Is that really it? Oh my gosh, we're almost done. Okay, well, 
We'll be back soon with the Morocco unit study. I've been really looking forward to that one. And if you guys decide to do any of these activities, I'd love for you to come on back and let me know how you and your kiddos liked them. Remember that all the books and materials that I'm able to link, I always have them in the description box. Any videos or books I reference are always linked as well. I've got a Pinterest board you can check out that's just to do with the Japan unit study. So lots of resources in the description box. As always, I want to thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a big thumbs up before you go. I'd also love it if you'd subscribe and click the notification bell because I post at least three times a week and I wouldn't want you to miss a minute. Thanks so much again for watching. See you real soon.